Well, I went down into a Egypt land Well, in the mind of the writing all the time boom, boom. I hear some talk about a Christian man Well, my Lord is writing all the time Oh, I did say that he was the Christ And my Lord was writing all the time He saw him coming all robed in white Well, then my Lord is writing all the time He my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord Pender County, North Carolina, like many areas in coastal North Carolina, faces development pressure from the rapidly growing city of Wilmington, located just 15 minutes to the south. Yet many old school buildings in Pender County still stand and give their quiet testimony about the order of life here from the early 1900s to the 1960s. They tell a complex story of the pride that black and white communities had in their schools and of the relationship between those segregated communities. In the early 1920s, Pender County built six brick schools for whites and provided transportation to these centralized schools. Bond issues were passed to ride around through North Carolina and you see these vintage brick veneer schools that were built about 1925. However, black children walked, sometimes up to five or six miles to attend small primary schools scattered throughout the county. It was important to them because all of their lives they had made an X and somebody else wrote their name. And they didn't want their children to be in that situation. They wanted their children educated. Approximately 50% of Pender County children were black. During Reconstruction and in the four decades that followed, black communities frequently created small schools in homes, churches, old barns, and lodge buildings. Some communities built simple schoolhouses and often supplied room and board for the teachers. And the black people sold pies and chicken dinners and whatnot to help build a school. Black families' involvement with the schools they helped to build was ongoing. They often helped to maintain the school, as was the case for the Love Grove School in western Pender County. Built by a church during the Reconstruction era, and used as a public school until 1958. My name is uh, Bernice Walker White. My mother is Carrie Walker. Carrie Walker came to this school, and so did all of her children. Arthur Harry, my uncle, and my grandma raised me. I remember going, because sometimes our shoes would be wore out, you know, and get bad. And Grandma would make us go anyhow. It would be cold. I remember I used to go a little piece, it would be cold and squat out, you know, try to warm my feet. <laughs> That's been a long time. I remember Uncle had been work on that school, and we had to go carry him some dinner. If it had not been for the efforts of Pender's black communities and the pioneering philanthropy of Julius Rosenwald, black schools in Pender County would have remained terribly inadequate. However, in 1912, Booker T. Washington, founder of Tuskegee University, convinced philanthropist Julius Rosenwald to assist black communities that were willing to raise money for school building. Pender County's black residents organized and raised funds to build 15 Rosenwald schools. They were told that Rosenwald would pay half, but that if they would raise the other half to build a school. But Mr. and Ms. Corbett said that they knocked on the door of every black family in that district 
he sat down and he said, sometimes I got some pennies. Sometimes I got a nickel. Sometimes I got a dime. And once in a blue moon, I would get a dollar. But we kept going. The funding package that built the Kane Tuck Rosenwald School was actually more complex. The Rosenwald Fund typically matched the black community's contribution up to 25% of the cost of the school. However, Rosenwald money was not released until the school board had committed to supporting the school. In order to build the Kane Tuck School, the black community gathered $1,226. The Rosenwald Fund contributed $800, and the school board committed $674. The property for the school was donated by B.F. Keith. Land for Rosenwald schools was frequently donated by either black or white community members. B.F. Keith is said to have donated the site for the Kane Tuck School. Benjamin Franklin Keith, he was the son or grandson of the original Keith, uh, was William Keith, that got the land grant in 1820. And uh, a lot of the church land and the school land, they got it from them. First day going to school was right here. I was six years old, I was born in 1916. And when the school was just built that year too. It was nice because it was brand new at that time. T.T. Murphy is the one that got, got it started with Juden Road. Juden Road had a lot of money, and that's why, how he wanted to use his money. We had spent a lot of our childhood going to black school programs. In fact, we always looked forward to going to the commencements at the black schools. Because my father would always go and he would take us. So it was something we always looked forward to. T.T. T. Murphy, Pender County's longtime superintendent, combined progressive views with a practical realization. The Rosenwald School Building Program offered tremendous value to Southern school systems. Mr. Murphy, T.T. T. Murphy, he was, he was a come over here to the school and build it and see how they and, and check on see if the students attending the schools good. Washington and Rosenwald thought that earlier efforts to improve Southern black education had neglected school facilities. The Rosenwald Fund provided plans for carefully designed school buildings that could also serve as community meeting places. Even today, Rosenwald schooled buildings can often be identified by their trademark nine over nine pane windows. Designed to maximize natural light in rural schools that had no access to electricity. It's pine and that pine is made from I call it the old-fashioned pine. That has a lot of, it had tar in it. it the, the termites didn't, don't even eat into this stuff here. And if you painted it, it kept painting it and kept it covered. It lasts for years, years, and years. This is the outhouse. It was a, a, a small building with a concrete flooring with two built stools that you could sit on. It, they were in use as long as the school was there. Rosenwald Fund architects provided plans for hygienic outhouses, providing a model of how to combat the pinworm that plagued the rural South. The classes had a blackboard that would raise up and down between uh, the first and the fifth, and the fifth through the seventh. Sadie A. Williams. Her classroom was the first students. 
Helen Foy Hall's classroom was the latter of the seven years. Pull the petition up, like when they had the commencement day, the last day, they pulled this, uh, and they go up high to the wall, and that means everybody be together. We used to go through the swamp, down back, down through there. We had pine trees. We would rake pine straw up, pile it up in the evening on the way home. From each pile, we, we get that pile, we would burn. There, we light that and burn and warm by it. And then we put it out. Then we go to the next one. By that time, everybody's cold again, we build another one. Truly, uh, being away and coming back here, it doesn't seem as that it's as cold now as it was then because the earth used to freeze over and it would be icicles in the earth and it would pop the earth open and spew up. Yes, we walked some days. Uh, some days the bus would pick us up and bring us and that was the same bus that would take the students on to Penda County, the older students on to Penda County Training School. But sometimes those buses, would, that bus would break down, would become non-functional. So we would have to walk. It felt like 10 miles, but <laughs> I'm sure it was not 10. So I would say anywhere from five, five to six. The students maintained the grounds and the classrooms. The older guys would come in in the morning and make a fire. The teacher would send some of us out to find some kindling splunk, and that mostly what we would, I would have to do me and some of the other boys would go out and cut some kindling splunk and bring back in here. We would come in, uh, everybody would have jackets. We, we called them lumber jackets we had back in the day then. And there is a, where one of those bathrooms is over there, that's where a closet, we would have that for the clothes closet. We put that away. Although all Rosenwald Fund school plans had space designated for industrial education, in reality, these spaces were often converted to other uses. In the primary schools, the room labeled industrial classroom frequently became additional regular classroom space, or as was the case with the Kane Tuck School, a kitchen. This was to make meals for the school. Industrial education was promoted alongside academics at the high school level in both black and white high schools of that era. Pictures of Booker T. Washington, Pender County Superintendent T.T. T. Murphy, and of Julius Rosenwald reminded Kane Tuck students of their benefactors. Always started with a prayer, I would, we called it devotion. Prayer, we saluted the flag, that's where I learned to say the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and we even sang a song. One would lead a song, the teacher would play it, and then one would uh, lead in prayer, or the Lord prayer, what it would be. Everyone should give reference to who you are and where you came from, uh, your creator, and I'm sure this is why we were given that. It would show that you would you actually learn to know that you should love everyone. I can remember a statement from my first teacher was Miss Sadie A. Williams. Was whatever you do, 
and do it well. She was uh, a disciplinarian. Uh, she just didn't play. You know, you would get the paddle or the switch, and uh, she would let you know why you were getting it, but you got it. And um, she was loving, and like I said, she was nurturing. There was always that uh, uh, encouragement to be positive about yourself and, and uh, to work with you and, and, and help you to read and, and uh, to write well, not just write, but write well. And uh, same thing with math and stuff, not just to do it, but to do it well. Uh, and she would go repeat it over and over again until you got it. They stayed up in this area during the week and went back to Wilmington on the weekends to their families. And they lived with a lady during my schooling years here called, her name was Mrs. Dine. I think since the community worked together, I don't think if they had to pay for housing, it was a minimal amount of money. They imparted uh, the work ethic message. They also uh, wanted us to, in order to be successful, they always stressed that you had to have an education and they stressed that we should focus on learning do our best and everything else will come together. I know mainly Mrs. Hall, the, the teacher of grades four through six, would stress that constantly. I vividly remember um, working hard and she said, called me up to her desk and said, as a surprise, I have a surprise, but I'm going to tell you in advance, since you've worked so hard, I'm going to take you home with me one weekend. And from going from here to Wilmington for from Friday through Sunday was a real treat. And the teachers then, they took time with you and they made sure that, you know, you were learning. And the way they did it, we call them teacher assistants now, but they were real smart in the way they did it, they would teach the older kids first and get them started with their work. And then uh, if you were a sixth grader, you might be able to help with the fourth graders. Or if you were a fifth grader, you could help with the second or third grader. So after they got them pretty much going into what they wanted them to do, then they let them also help them teach the younger children. That way they got around to basically everybody. Well. Uh... In the morning time, we would have uh, a spelling, arithmetic on maybe Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And Thursday and Friday, we would have history and geography. We had three grades in, in one room, first, second, third grade. And the teacher would work with the first grade, and work with the second grade, and work with the third grade. So. In a sense, you were getting uh, challenged to learn what the older children were learning, even as a first grader. And by the time you got up to the next grade, you, you'd you heard it, and um, it made it a lot easier for you. And uh, I can remember when I left and went to another school in the third grade, I was further along than a lot of those students because I'd been in a situation where I'd heard that stuff repeated over and over again. And uh, so I was reading at a high level and uh, could write very well and could do math uh, you know, very well. I know definitely that they wanted us, wanted me to succeed. And we did have recitations that we had to learn. Sometimes I have some sort of a play like you knew for you to act in. And uh, I used to see a speech or something other like that. They wanted the students to be well rounded. They wanted to have everything, you know. That's why they used to stress plays, recitations, reciting poems, and all that stuff. February brings the rain, all the frozen lakes again. 
March bring breezes loud and shrill, stirs the dancing daffodils. April brings the primrose sweet, scatters daisies at our feet. May bring flocks of pretty lambs, skipping by their fleecy dams. June brings tulips, lilies, roses, fills the children's hand with poses. Hot July brings cooling showers, apricots and gilly flowers. August brings the sheaves of corn, then the harvest home is born. Some children dropped out of school to work and help their families, while others finished the primary grades and traveled across the county to Pender County Training School to complete a high school education. My father farmed uh, sharecrop. So like, you know, you used to pick up corn stalks to, to get off the, so they can burn the corn stalks so they can plow the ground up. And my mother, my father wanted to take us out of school for a few days to pick up the corn stalks so he, he could plow. My mother wouldn't let him. He said, you stay right in his school. He gets you. He said, we'll do that on the weekend. Pick up the corn stalks and burn them. And so, uh, I mean, just the one thought of what he was saying, he wanted to get the work done. And my mother wanted to get us continue in school, get our education. So it all worked out. She, he agreed and let us go and continue on school and do it whenever we can. I was, I was a good learner in school, but I couldn't go to school regular as I wanted to go. See, my car, you know, sometimes in a family, it's one in there a little more handy than the other end. It seemed like I was the and it's one night stay home a lot to see after the animals and things like that and the rest of them would be gone. The, the women folk would take the child, the oldest children, and we would go pick blueberries. And my dad, he would take them and sell them. When I was younger, I did not see the struggles. But now as I think back, oh, what struggles? Um, my mom did not go out of, outside of the home and work until after we had all grown up. Uh, she would work on the farms with, you know, helping with tobacco with my dad and that kind of, but um, other than that, she didn't go outside of the home until after we all grew up. I. I think back and I said, even though I did not like it then, I said that was a part of the plan. And it taught me the importance of working. That's where that foundation was built. And I was able to go into a lot of situations and survive. I continued education, which was Pender County Training School. I completed high school in 1952. Mrs. Suzette L. Smith, who was employed by Anna T. Jeans' endowment to improve black education in the South, organized a community effort to raise funds to build a Rosenwald School in Rocky Point, North Carolina. There was a need for a school because they didn't have one and people began to get together. They met and decided that a school was needed. And that was when people began to raise money. And during the time that they raised money, that was when the Julius Rosenwald Fund began. I think that was around 1917. And I guess when people saw that there was an interest and a need for a school, they began to, you know, come together and raise money to get the buildings that they needed. And I think the first one was a four-room school. Both of my grandfathers and Mr. Georgia Kennedy, I think they contributed, I think it was $1,200 to get the land because they were told that they could not uh, contribute anything unless they had the land. So these three people gave the money uh, so that they could purchase 
I believe it was 10 acres so that they could build additional buildings. Of the eight buildings that eventually made up the Pender County Training School campus, at least four were partially funded by the Rosenwald Fund. Parents and community members continued to provide monetary support for the school until it was closed. Uh, our parents uh, went to or came to Rocket Point um, in 1931. And um, as principal and as teacher, uh, there was a need for uh, two people there. There were supervisors in the South. They would um, go around the schools in the poor areas, rural areas in the South, and um, look at the educational programs and, and attempt to elevate them or attempt to, to just determine if, if the learning was congruent in all of the communities. And that mainly is, is what I recall that she attempted to do. His father was a, a big uh, land owner and, uh, and farmer. And uh, I think my dad uh, did not feel as though uh, that was the way he wanted to go, that uh, he felt as though he wanted to make it in a different area. He did say that he admired his instructor um, at the school in uh, Chatham County. Well, one of the reasons was that he drove a car and uh, he, he thought that that was what, uh, and I think this fellow that he tried to emulate uh, went to a and and that's how he found out about it. He also had to sort of work his way through. I know he told me that uh, he had caught a, a train in uh, Chatham County where they were living and uh, and he had heard about uh, A&T and so he went over to Greensboro and he got there. Um, he couldn't register at the school because uh, I think the school that he uh, had attended uh, didn't go to but six to maybe eight or tenth grade and so he had to uh, do uh, some remedial work in order to be able to get into A&T. Uh, at that time, of course, he had to, uh, he would fire up the furnaces in, uh, I believe, in one of the hotels over in uh, Greensboro, along with uh, the other things that he would do there, uh, taking those courses uh, that, were, uh, that were needed in order to get a uh, uh, degree. The, every setting for us really was, was a learning setting, at home as well as, as at school. We had a lot of activities that we were involved in at, at home that were educational activities. I remember uh, that my dad on, uh, uh, on some weekends was uh, playing saxophone at the officers club at, uh, at that time they had an officers club at, at Wilmington Airport. And uh, he was a combination musician and sometimes was uh, working at the bar. I think he uh, felt as though the more education that you got, the better things were gonna be for you. Uh, he, uh, but he did, he was, I think, very, quite, very innovative. I can remember one thing that, that he uh, did during the Second World War. Um, my father, uh, he rented some, uh, uh, I think, seven acres of uh, land. And uh, I would go with him sometime. He'd have a, well, he'd have a mule and, uh, we would go and uh, we'd plow, and of course at noontime, I can remember jumping on the back of the mule and uh, galloping back to home. Uh, and I can remember after the mule had eaten, 
it was very difficult to get him to go back out in the field. I, I grew up in the house there, uh, adjoining the Pender County Training School. First they had to get off of 117, and you traveled on down. The cannery was on the left side. On the right side was Murphy Hall. You traveled down, there was Pearsall, the gym -torium. Then you, you made a right angle turn to the right, and Mr. Anderson's building was there. And you continued with that right turn, and, and there was that 1919 Rosenwald building. I was born in 28. My grandparents read me, and they were Peter and Caroline Royals. They lived here in Rocky Point, and I was born and read in the house next door. The wooden house right across the field. My grandfather built that house. He was a carpenter and a farmer. And my grandmother was a stay home and a farm lady. The um, years that uh, I started to school, I started to school early in life. Uh, I was at home with my grandparents. She had to work out in the fields. So what she did was, to carry, they had me to go to school with my aunt. And I started the school when I was like four years old at Rocky Penn County Training School. The teacher was Mrs. H.V. Gatterson. She was teaching the first grade. And when the season was over with the work, my grandmother had stopped me from school and had me to stay at home. The teacher wanted to know what happened to me. She said, well, I do, I have, I'm not working now, so I can bring her back home. She said, no, you don't. You send her back to school. I remember the Rosenwald fund them telling us about it. And uh, because um, Mr. T.T. Murphy at the time, being, being superintendent, saw to it that uh, we had schools that were kind of, he, he tried to get our schools upgraded. And I know the buildings, some of them were built by the PTA people who raised money to get schools built after they got the first building. And I remember going to the first building as a primary building. And then I remember going to the elementary school building, which was another one that was built. And Mr. T um, Anderson did a lot getting some of the schools built, but that before my time, but by the time I got there, it was already built. I attended 1948 to 1952. I think of the atmosphere of the teachers in the school. They had such good rapport with the students. And I wanted to be just like my eye teacher. I wanted to be a Professor Anderson. Singleton C. Anderson, or Professor Anderson as he became known, arrived in 1920 at the Pender County Training School. Educated at Hampton University, the alma mater of Booker T. Washington, S.C. Anderson combined an incredible work ethic with the conviction that young people could better their communities. Oh, he lived here, and he was from um, Virginia, I think, but he just loved Rocky Point, and he was a member of St. Matthew Baptist Church, you know, and he worked well with those people in that church. You know, and his wife was a beautiful person. She was the home economic teacher. She taught us to sew, you know, how to hem, and, you know, use the machine, how to cook. I can remember some of those things now. Oh, Mr. Anderson was a great man. He, whatever you wanted to know, and he knew he would teach you. He weren't a person that, being he was a grown up person all together already, that he didn't have time for you. He had time for everybody. He was quite a bit older than we were, but we used to race. Ah, that man. <laughs> He was a fast man. He could outrun the average one. <laughs> yeah, he was good with that way. He was fast with his hands. He could do 
most anything he really wanted to do. I, I just got a kick out of being around him. And he and I was, well, very close together, very close. I recall that he was a very loving, kind, and inspirational person. He was, and all of the young men really loved him. Uh, and wherever you would see him, you would see a crowd of young men gathered around him. Uh, well, he did a lot for the community, that's just it, everywhere. And as a matter of fact, the house next door to me is one of the houses that he helped build. That's my understanding. And as I look back, I saw this big picture of this house in the newspaper, in a paper. They were talking about S.C. Anderson and how he went from house to house or wherever, you know, the children needed him to help with, uh, you know, building or construction of something in the community. He was, he was just well known, well known. Sometimes he would go out in the communities, you know, and visit the people and find out what people wanted to do. And if there was a farmer who didn't have the skills needed to plant or raise a certain crop, he would go to their homes or to their farms and help them. He had bought anything he wanted in that shop. He had, he had uh, a turning leg, which you could make tables. Uh, you could make table legs. If you want to make a bed, you can make a bed. If you want to build a house, he would teach you that. You know how to build a house. Um, the first time I heard of square roots, I didn't know what in the world it was talking about, the Pythagorean theorem. But he was not a math teacher, but he was familiar with that enough that he could teach you the square roots. He wanted us to make sure that we were able to go places and see different things. He would take his personal car and take us shop students, and we would go to Raleigh to the States Fair. We all had to make written statements about what we saw, what we learned there, or whatnot. We bring it back to the whole class. Oh, they wanted us to do the best we could and be the best we could. And it wasn't just education, it was the whole individual, the whole person, uh, and not just one aspect of it. They were for education. And what is different, what was different then than it is now, I think the teachers took more time with the children, had a greater interest in them, wanting them to learn. I mean, that was, that was just really it. They went from house to house to, you know, and they weren't afraid, you know, if the child needed to be in discipline. Under John T. Daniel Sr.'s leadership, the number of Pender County Training School graduates who went on to college grew from less than 1% in 1931 to 25% in 1956. Considering the depressed economy of Pender County, this was a remarkable achievement. They would tell her that. She'd say, you come on now, you study. You know, they were very interested. You know, they wanted us to learn. And they took so much pain with us. The Rosenwald Fund also supported construction of boarding houses for teachers called teacherages. They had a cottage across from the school where that housed the teachers. And um, some of them went to the local churches right here in the community. So we, we were really close with the teachers. My uh, ninth grade English teacher was Mrs. Ms. Lizette Pearsall. And she was very encouraging because knowing that I liked music and wanted to learn to play the piano, didn't have one at home. She had one in her classroom. She would allow me to come in her classroom at lunchtime and practice. And that was not allowed by the school, but she sent me in there and <laughs> allowed me to practice on her piano. I never forget her for that. When you, if you, your parents could afford, they would always have you, you were directed to college and they were trying to prepare you for college. That was the way they taught you. 
back then, I guess you might call it college prep, but that's what they want. They were preparing me for college. It served the purpose of preparing me for the next step because once entering, once I entered uh, Winston-Salem, we had to take an exam for placement. So I was in one group below the highest group. And that came from develop, all of that development that I received at Penda County Training School prepared me to enter Western Asylum. Professor Anderson would take us to, to ANT. Uh, he, took, uh, he would try to take a class every year, most of the time. He would take you up there to be in that college atmosphere to meet other people and see, you know, what you could be or what you could do. My grandfather always said that he couldn't afford to send her to school. She, if you let her go, you told my grandmother, if she goes, you're going to take your help away because I was helping her in the fields. So she said, let her go. I'll make it. And then he said, and so the principal, Mr. Daniel, and his wife, Mrs. Daniel, assured him that if you let her go, she'll help you one day and you'll be happy that you did. So that's how I got to go, and so I was able to work my way all the way through college. My other sisters had already graduated from college. At least I had three to graduate from college. And of course, as one graduated, that one would help the other. So that's how many of us were able to get our education. In 1945, I, I skipped 11th. Oh yeah, 11th grade was my our last year in high school. And um, my favorite teacher then was, I had several favorite teachers then, so Ms. Allison was one of them, and I still kept myself latched to Ms. Daniel. <laughs> we uh, were the last class to graduate in 1945 from the 11th grade. The county then saw fit to add 12th grade. So the next year they skipped graduation, and, we, and there was no graduation in 46. Each class gave something to leave a landmark to know that uh, they had passed through. It was like a vote. Well, a lot of times they wouldn't know what the principal wanted. And after the principal said what he wanted, then the class would come together and they would vote for whatever was done. And of course, they had fundraising to get the money to do it with. When I came out of college, Mr. Daniel saw that I got work. I had worked when I asked how I became one of the, my first employment was there in Rocky Point. I started teaching in September, August of 19, not teaching, but they're working at the school in 1949. During the 1950s, Pender County's Board of Education began replacing the age wooden primary schools that blacks were attending. One of the new brick primary schools for black children was built as the Pender County Training School Annex. And Mr. Murphy, T.T. Murphy, who was superintendent for over 50 years, decided that he was going to try to make a better uh, schools for the black community because he promised them that. The agreement was made then to build elementary schools around the county and that to improve the conditions of the black schools. And that's when Rocky Point Elementary was built. We thought we were really getting there. Yeah, because they, they had their own principal over there too. And Mr. Dane was the principal for both schools, but a lot of attention was given to the elementary schools at that time. I didn't ever teach over there though. I always taught on the old campus. So the school was getting old and they, and they had better facilities over there too of uh, West Penn in I think they was pretty satisfied at it. I believe they were. However, high school accessibility remained an issue. There were two public high schools for black students in the county versus five for whites. I, I think they, they were surprised with the uh, Brown uh, versus Board of Education uh, result. Um, that, of course, occurred after the uh, military had been uh, integrated by President uh, Truman, I believe. Um, but I don't think that they uh, thought that things were going to get 
to the place that it would be a colorblind situation here in the United States. Mm -hmm. In 1956, two years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, the Pender County Board of Education issued a statement. The Board of Education of Pender County feels it would be unwise to combine the white and Negro schools in Pender County. The board favors a harmonious voluntary segregation of the Pender County schools with a goal of equal facilities and instruction. I was contacted by the superintendent in sometime early 1965 because at that point the Health Education and Welfare Department was implementing Civil Rights Act, which essentially uh, required that there be uh, uh, no segregation. Uh, and it didn't mandate integration. What it did was say, if you got federal funds, then you couldn't discriminate. And almost all schools at that point was getting, were getting federal funds. So it was a, a financial pressure that required it. And, uh, uh, there were various uh, uh, requirements uh, being placed to fund the school systems throughout the South, including North Carolina. There were those who wanted to be integrated, and there were those who didn't want to be integrated. So uh, our role was to try to prepare them for integration, because we knew it was coming. And we were trying to prepare the students, and letting them know you had to do your best and be there. And they fell in out a lot with us. <laughs> we, got, we lost a lot of friends in doing that. But um, it became a very disgusting thing to say that we are getting ready for integration now. And we're going to have to move from our school. And that's what we didn't want to do. We did not want to move from our schools. Uh, some did, and some didn't, because they thought that were better opportunities at the white schools than they were at our schools and that they were getting a better education than we were getting at those schools. So we had to go through that, that period of adjustment. We started off with what uh, was called a freedom of choice plan, uh, which essentially was a one-way plan. Uh, any black who wanted to attend a, a, a predominantly white school was allowed to do so but a white was not allowed to transfer to a black school. Like we never had a request for it, but that was not part of the plan. Nor could whites transfer to other white schools or predominantly white schools. And initially, uh, there were a few takers, but not very many. It wasn't really a, a mass crossover. Uh, had to integrate the faculty and I think there were three the first year. I didn't like it. <laughs> I'll be frank, I did not care for it because we were losing good students. And, I, and did, we didn't realize at the time that we were going to it closed the school out. We, I didn't realize we were going to really close our school. Uh, there was no question about Burr Pender County uh, complying. One of the things that uh, came up very early on uh, at the school board meeting, I remember one time was uh, uh, at that time, people like uh, George Wallace were standing in the doorway and saying never, and troops were being sent to um, uh, Mississippi and other places. And in fact, there were problems probably in, the, in other counties in North Carolina uh, with integration. But um, uh, questions were raised sometimes at the school board meetings about uh, how much they had to do. and. Uh, I remember Dudley Robbins saying at one meeting that he had been in World War II, had been a prisoner of war uh, in the German prison camps, and that uh, he knew what he was fighting for. And when Congress passed the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, the representatives of the United States had spoken. And uh, as far as he was concerned, as long as he was on the Board of Education, it was going to obey the law, whatever that law was. It was a lot of tension early on. I think they started off with the freedom of choice. So uh, some children had already moved. Uh, it was more of the, in the freedom of choice, it was more of the black children going to the white school at the time than black children uh, than being the other way around. 
And um, then when the uh, laws were changed where it was mandatory, uh, I think the first couple of years maybe it was a little tense. It may not have been so bad in the area here because a lot of children, they were, I mean, they worked together on the farms and so, uh, you know, they knew each other. And uh, that made it better. It was a surprise for them to shut us down. And the reason that I felt bad because I, I wasn't aware that they were going to shut us down, especially in the Home Economics Department. I felt like that we had arrived at the things we were working toward, but to just be shut out completely, I don't think that was our goal to get to give up. I think our goal was to to make to try to have equality, but not to have to give up what you have and move from where you are. I had brand new equipment. We had raised money, but brand new dishes, pots, pans, everything, silverware. And when we when I when I left, I was not able to carry any of that equipment with me. I didn't know when I got there, it was all gone mostly to the schools that we were to go to, and I didn't know where I was going. And so that there was another thing, it was a shock. Because I had inherited all of Ms. Anderson's things that she had worked hard for. I can't forget how I can't come up going to this school. I can't forget that. I always really remember that. White people that lived in our neighborhood, they weren't bad people, uh, you know. They were good people. They had so much more than we had, they could leave uh, their high school and go on and get a good job in the bank or whatever, typing and all that. They didn't give us all of that here. And most everything we got, we had to raise money and buy it. Where we live, uh, it was a good distance from here, but we had to walk. And the white school was closer to where we lived, but of course we couldn't attend that school. But of course those were the times that existed. At that time, we did not um, feel angry about it. We only thought about it years later, what could have been, but was not. The major legacy is that it helped all of us. It helped us to elevate our living conditions and we could in turn reach back and help our parents. The last operating Rosenwald School in Pender County, the Pender County Training School campus, was closed when the schools integrated. However, remnants of this remarkable era in education still exist in Pender County and throughout the South. Whether reclaimed as vibrant community centers or overgrown with kudzu, Rosenwald schools remind us that education is something that black Americans have always shaped and owned. I didn't worry about the way that I had to fare to go there because I was just anxious to go and learn. But uh, I look back at it now and sometimes it like it brings tears to my eyes.